welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, one who actually brought the appropriate drink this time around. <laughs> oh. Previously known for for honor and for, for glory, now known for the a, its first module slash expansion in the form of the Grand Tourney, a a project that got funded in about two hours. The one the one and only Orion Scott Krolek, M.A. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's habit that I put that behind the name, you know. Yeah. I I know that's why that's why I had to to that's why I had to toss one in there. <laughs> uh, that's just how I'm known across you know so much of the web. So mm -hmm. uh, I've taken to signing everything as Orion Kaylee, you know, <laughs> with yep. the awkward last name. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. So where should we start? Um, so I th I suppose I suppose the first thing to start is congr congratulations on getting. Um, for honor and for glory, um, released pro released proper. Yeah, um, we're actually expecting the. I've got the chronicler's guide in print uh, from the printing house. The first batches are coming in now. Um, players' guides coming in in about oh five or six days. Um, I'm really stoked. Uh, I've got the proofs in and looks great in print. And uh, we've been using them at the table for our playtest groups. It's been about what two and a half months or so since last time we talked and uh we've we've grown a lot since then mm -hmm. uh we've actually founded a uh, kind of a gaming studio uh that we call world serpent games um i'm a huge fan of the norse stuff so um you know it seemed appropriate and uh my co-author and i uh kind of just ran with it and uh we made enough um money from the the kickstarter that we were able to kind of start doing this as a like a part-time thing on the side you know uh, and uh we've loved it like we've had, mm -hmm. had a lot of great feedback from fans and uh you know we've set up a a website at for uh kind of making this our flagship game and uh the first thing we felt that we should do afterwards was you know kind of put out like a um a module of sorts but not really a module in um the, the classic kind of D and D sense, like there's no you know dungeon map or that sort of thing. Um, but the the Grand Tourney is a uh, more of a, a source book that gives you an experience that like adds to the game for late period, like uh, high Middle Ages or, or early Renaissance kind of play. Mm -hmm. I like to call these kind of things themed expansions. Yeah, exactly. That, that's a great term for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, we're still working on the Age of Sales, uh, which is our first major expansion that's going to push us all the way to the um, Industrial Evolution in history. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got a playtest group going for that. We've, uh, there's been some great stuff going on at the table there. But um, I really wanted to just... We, 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 we did the grand, the, the, the grand Tourney originally as a promo event at um, Conuga here in Chattanooga, Tennessee um, in the gaming room. And a lot of people had a lot of fun with it, and we'd come up with some kind of alternative, uh, alternate rules for, uh, you know, how to do a joust, melee events, and things like that with blooded weapons and and you know, tourney lances as opposed to military lances and that sort of thing. Like the technology actually did, and uh, you know, it, it just turned into like, wow, this is this is kind of great, and. Uh, we decided to, you know, stick it on paper and and, and make it a, a kind of a uh, uh, alter, you know, kind of rules expansion, uh, you know, as as it comes comes out to uh, let people play this for themselves in uh, multiple periods or you know multiple settings uh, through the, the the high Middle Ages to early Renaissance with an example given in the book um, of a, a specific tourney set in 1425 England. Uh, during the height of the Hundred Years' War, and there's lots of really cool stuff going on during that period um, for the you know the people who want to kind of play it more highbrow history. Um, so anyway, that being said, uh, it's it's actually had a lot of support on uh, uh, more than I ever thought it would on Kickstarter, 
and uh, we're going strong and uh, there's a lot of great stuff. So let me turn it back to you. What are your questions about the, the, the module? Okay, let me let me get the um, let me get the dumb question out of my system first. Sure. How many times has in, how many times has someone brought up a knight's tale when t when discussing this module? <laughs> almost every time, and you know, <laughs> almost every system has this the grand tourney. Like even with that specific title, somewhere there. So we wanted to do it a little bit different, um, uh, differently, um, in that it's not just about you know, the melee event or grand melee or joust or archery or what have you. But we wanted to kind of give a lot of um, latitude for role play for all the stuff at one of these kinds of events that actually happened in history. Um, a lot of latitude for role play as far as what goes on behind the scenes. Um, courtly love, diplomacy, uh, you know, statesmanship, uh, uh you know, even ass assassination attempts at feasts and that sort of thing. Um, we wanted to kind of broaden the perspective and, and make it not just like, you know, you're going to Ren Fair or something, but really give the opportunity to role play um, along with all the, uh, the kind of the obvious nuts and bolts of what attorney is. Uh, that being said, yeah, the Knight's Tale comes up all the time <laughs> that and uh robin hood men in tights when it comes to the uh the archery events you know he spit he split robin's arrow in twain <laughs> mm -hmm. oh and to be fair to be fair both of, both of them are both of them are great um great things to steal from and any dm knows um that one of the core rules of being a dm is steal from everything yeah <laughs> and it depends on the group that you're playing um and that's one of the things I love about uh, Front of for Glory is we're, we're really, you know, we, we present ourselves as being kind of like really rooted in history in a lot of ways. But at the same time, we give latitude depending on like what the table's doing um, and who's playing at the table. You know, some groups want to have more of a kind of slapstick kind of, you know, adventure in the Middle Ages. And that's fine. Um, some, some groups want to have a, a highbrow historical experience. And that's excellent that's cool you know uh all that being said it's 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 what you want to put into it what you want to make of it um we just wanted to make sure that what we're presenting in the core books and in the um in the the grand journey uh kind of mirrors what was actually going on somewhat you know at least it has its kind of its roots in um actual like medieval uh history Um, and with, with that in with that in mind, mm -hmm. um, when I think when I think of other games that have done some sort of grand tourney or or similar type of events, one of the big names that comes to mind you've probably heard this brought up to you more than once is Pendragon. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had they. Pendragon is very much aiming for a more historical, a more historical approach, with, mm -hmm. as opposed to the possibility of historical or slapstick that you guys are going for. But I'm well, I'm, I'm not saying that we go for slapstick. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying we we you're able to do that, you mm -hmm. know, um, and it, it still plays just as well. Yeah, but the point that I was getting at was that. One of them has a ver has a very direct leaning towards what it's doing. The other one, um, it's not as hard and fast about. Mm -hmm. I guess is the way I guess is the way I could put it. But what I am what I am curious ab what I am curious about is how is how much advi how much advice you give for people starting out that may that maybe don't have a historical background but want but want to use aspects of the grand tourney in their campaigns oh um that's that's one of the great things i, I i've loved putting together uh with this book is the um the 1425 like if you're going to run it as a one-shot story mm -hmm. and just sit down and play the game um your your knights are provided for you in the in the back of the book um 
as character sheets, even uh, printable character sheets. And um, they each have a solid bio written about uh, them, their life up into that, that year, up into at 1425 um, that puts them in context of, of, you know, this is their overall, this is what's going on in England and in France um, and, and largely in Europe. This is furthermore, this is where this person is in life. This is what they've done. This is how people kind of see them and uh, contextualize that and kind of give you a cliff notes for that character. So somebody could go through the back of the grand tourney, looking at the, the 1425 tournament and look through those cliff notes essentially, and pick a night that sounds, you know, just cool as hell to them and sit down with a chronicler and they've got a character sheet already in hand and then they're good to go. You know, uh, the only thing they need other than the grand tourney is the player's guide because that's, that has the, uh, the base rules in it. Uh, for combat and, you know, equipment and things like that. Uh, that being said, we have given a lot of equipment and extra background traits and flaws and um, all that sort of uh, rick and a racket that's particular to a tournament um, in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you don't have like a heavy historical background, uh, I've, I've worked really hard to sit down and, and write this in a way that allows people to um, who don't have that 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 knowledge of what's going on in the, the you know the hundred years war or war of roses or whatever and be able to like put that together for themselves and and uh or not put them for themselves but you know be able to piece it together from what i'm giving them and kind of have like you know role play hooks and 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 some context mm-hmm. so they know where to go as a player it certainly makes sense I'd say I'd say an, I'd say another thing is, um, and th- I will admit I'm go- I will admit for these next set of questions I'm leaning more into the whole GM advice thing because I do think that's crucial for something like this. Sure, yeah, like I, I'd love to <laughs> delve into those questions more because it makes me think about you know what to tell uh, potential chroniclers uh, mm. to do. <laughs> but. One of, the, but I th- I'd say one other thing. One other thing that, if it if it isn't already covered, should certainly be considered is how is how to f- is how to frame the party mm-hmm. within the, within this kind of tourney. Because obviously, with with something like D and D, you have an easy you have an easy frame in the as much as I hate the term murder hobo, um, mm-hmm. or or the knaves in Brand Colonia, basically some variety of mercenary but for something like the grand tourney especially for the time period that's going on while you could do a bunch of mercenaries it's not going to 100 percent fit so i'm curious i'm curious how i'm curious how you if there's any advice on how to frame the background of the par- the background of the party the uniting force of that of the party depending on what angle they're taking that's an interesting question. See, here's the thing. Um, in the Grand Tourney, there is no party dynamic. It's essentially a PvP event. Um, that being said, if you're playing the out-of-the-box um, 1425 campaign, uh, or storyline, rather, um, there are laid out for you in the books certain political lines where certain houses are aligned, certain individuals are aligned. And you could sit down as a group and decide, okay, cool, we're going to play, you know, Lancastrians. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, people who are aligned to the house of Lancaster or the family of Lancaster. Mm-hmm. Um, Henry the Sixth is the ruling monarch. He's four years old at the point, but he is a Lancaster. England's ruled by regents, uh, heavily Lancastrian regents, uh, the Lancasters, the Beauforts, etc., all of this is laid out for you in the book and, um, and in, the, in the notes specifically for this storyline. That being said, you can also play, and what I would find more fun to play, is if you just let everybody pick who they want to play and you have vying um, 
factions within different houses. Uh, because, see, this is like 30 years before uh, the War of the Roses, a massive civil war in English society, right? Mm -hmm. Between uh, Richard of York and um, basically all the Lancastrian nobles that had been ruling for you know a couple of generations. Um, so there's already kind of lines in 1425, lines being drawn between these nobles um, as they vie for power and, and influence between each, uh, themselves. Uh, the king really isn't in power. You've got these regents who are ruling. Um, uh, one in France, and then his like shifty kind of scholarly brother, who is uh, the, the the Lord Protector of England itself. Um, they often don't seem to eye to eye. Uh, you've got um, Edmund Beaufort, a 19 year old nobleman who um, his father is on the ruling council, or his, I'm sorry, his uncle is on the ruling council. But he's sleeping with the Queen Dowager, Henry V's widow. Um, all these really kind of interesting facets, like written through all the plots of these characters uh, that are, you know, up until now, up until that year, uh, that are laid out for you. And you, if you sat down and played as kind of a PvP event, mm -hmm. you're going to end up with uh, individual characters played by each player that have you know, retainers and, and uh, a whole immense, uh, some of them are earls or, or barons or dukes. And um, they all have resources they can call upon both politically and um, uh, socially and, uh, uh, and, and materially. And they're all representing their families and themselves at the grand tourney as far as the events. But those role-playing bits that I uh, uh, mentioned will really come in where everybody is kind of making alliances and uh, kind of deciding who's going to side with who as uh, a major offensive is being mounted in France that later that year by uh, the Duke of Bedford, mm -hmm. uh, who is also a Lancaster. So it's, it's very kind of Game of Thrones-esque, you know. <laughs> this is where Game of Thrones got this shit. Yeah, uh, it's... Except, except with one hundred percent less season eight. Right, exactly. Screw season eight. <laughs> oh, and with with that, I suppose. In, you know, I was going. I was going to use um, Vikings as a bit as a better example, but that's a little bit too. Er that's a little bit too early. Yeah, it's way per early period. Oh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think if there's any. If there's any other if there's any other parallel besides um no I was I was gonna bring up the Charlemagne album but no that doesn't count either <laughs> shit it's so. it's a a little bit different approach than um, what I've seen anyway uh, kind of surveying across what what people have done with that concept the Grand Tourney mm -hmm. um, in that in Front and for Glory you've got a wealth system and with and and uh, background traits where you know you can define like what your social status is, and a lot of the people in the Grand Tourney, almost all of them are are like high level characters, quote unquote. If we had levels, um, they all have about 200, 250 build points. Um, they're powerful people from powerful families uh, because tournaments are. Let's face it, they're a sport of the nobility. Mm-hmm. And so each of them have kind of, you know, they all have their own backing from, from, from uh, noble houses. They all have their own um, kind of political agendas. And they're, they're um, all going to end up kind of figuring, as a player, you know, if you're playing one of these characters, you're going to have to figure out where you want to fall on the spectrum of power um, between a few major factions. And make alliances accordingly through the course of the tournament and all the you know processions and pageantry around the tournament the feasts you know etc um to be able to decide how you're going to align yourself or your family with um the forces that be that you know ultimately are going to go to war within the next you know generation mm -hmm. uh 30 years down the road and uh speaking of war of roses uh, we're kind of planning on having a source book 
specifically about that. <laughs> um, kind of a, a dynamic historical period for English history. Um, that being said, we've, we've, we've been doing a lot of planning lately and, you know, we're kind of thinking about having, uh, I really want to push, I've been pushing hard for a, uh, a Norse source book. Um, I love the Norse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just curious, perhaps... but um, do you have a play? Do you have a playlist off of, off on the side that has a bunch of folk metal in it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, folk metal, and also uh, I've been listening to a lot of uh, reenactors who have have picked up like lyres and things like that, and taken like Anglo-Saxon poetry and mm -hmm. you know put that to music and things. Um, my YouTube playlist is pretty uh, eclectic these days and uh, pretty medieval. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, keeping that, keeping that in keeping that in mind, you've touched on, you've touched on two particular angles that I think would be uh, I think would be a bit of a culture shock, even to, even to some people who consider themselves tabletop veterans. Mm -hmm. That being PvP mm -hmm. and in, and the it, and um intrigue ah <laughs> right so it, for somebody those are the who's... games where somebody worked intrigue into their game and and it sometimes divide even divides a party um in a traditional kind of role play um in tabletop role playing sense those are the games that i find most interesting um because you have to both define your character that you're playing and what they want um, as well as how they're going to get there. And sometimes you have to step on other characters toes to get it. But, and sometimes that pisses people at the table off, but you know, you're playing your character. You're it's, it's a role playing game. You're playing your role. Have, has, th has suggestions ever been given to, to the idea of players playing, mul playing um, multiple characters that, that gets shuffled in and out a la Ars Magica? Sure. Actually, we've done that quite a bit with um, the Age of Sales playtest um, because there's, surprisingly, with Pirates in the Caribbean in 1715, um, there's quite a bit of, of politics and um, kind of legalities concerned with some of the characters. So they have, you know, retainers that are heroic characters as well as um, armsmen and 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 uh, you know staff uh, the kind of the lower level NPC level characters that they've actually like taken the time to like sketch out and and uh, you know uh, we've got a, a a pirate captain for instance who knows has named and sketched out the stats for every single pirate on his crew <laughs> mm -hmm. and so sometimes it doesn't make sense for the captain to go but he might send his first mate and so that player will stop and play as you know stop playing the captain for a minute as the captain stays back at hog island you know near nassau and start playing the first mate for a minute and kind of switch roles back and forth a bit and it's been a lot of fun um we had a play test on sunday that was just phenomenal um the players at the edge of the seat the entire time as they kind of uh were 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 uh, faced down by the uh, the British Navy uh, and the, and their arch nemesis, <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, definitely with the 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 Grand Tourney, you're going to have the same sort of thing because uh, the point build values of these characters, um, i.e., you know uh, how experienced quote unquote they are, and the fact that they have so many retainers and underlings under them, where as far as playing at the table, sometimes it make, might make more sense to not play their main character, but to play those other ancillary characters. Their liegemen, essentially. Mm -hmm. Which, I think, I, I think, um, presenting these kind, presenting these kind of things in a way that isn't going to overwhelm, I, I believe, is crucial because you have because um, the. A lot of people who got who got raised up on some of the bigger entries in in fantasy in fantasy gaming will carry with it certain habits, mm -hmm. certain habits that I at my own table have um, tr have tried to wean people off of. 
Oh. Or at the, or at the very least point or at the very least point to the sign regarding some of the absolutely nots. Because <laughs> I because I wanted to take a page out of Wayne's world. <laughs> no stairway. No st no stairway and um I think I told you this before, but I have a friend who has a similar sign that says absolutely no piano man. <laughs> nice. And well, and any bar in Minnesota would pro should probably have a rule of absolutely no closing time. Right. <laughs> Seriously, you as bad as the song is, you have no idea how overplayed that guy, that got around here. Oh yeah, that, a lot of them down here do it too. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure that they do because everybody thinks they're clever doing that. Like, like how everybody thinks they're clever by by taking photos pretending to lean the Tower of Pisa. <laughs> right. Overplayed trope. <laughs> yeah, it's o it's overplayed, and and and, peop and people keep doing it. But um, now, give, given the fact that these sort of tourneys have have more th have more than their share of a variety of events, um, I'd like to delve into that for a bit. Okay. Now, obvious obviously there are certain obviously there are certain things to take into account from a fluff perspective. From a crunch perspective, I'm get I'm guessing that things like grand melee me melee joust archery and wrestling have their own little quirks compared to the normal rules for any for any of that kind of thing. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, for instance, wrestling and uh, pugilism. This is not something that's currently talked about uh, in terms of, of, of tournament um, or medieval combat much at all. Uh, I mean, fist strikes against a guy in armor don't really do anything. <laughs> um, and it was never really a tournament event. However, I added in the list because... Um, of you know, say you have a feast and you've got all of these nobles gathered together and you know noble a has a beef against uh, noble or noble a has a, a beef against noble B well they're gonna get drunk and somebody's gonna say something and if you're the guy presiding over this feast what's better to let them have a duel and kill each other in cold blood on your, your, you know, your, your feast hall floor or entertain your guests by deciding it um, where these two guys without armor um, engage in fisticuffs or a wrestling match and say, you know what? It's trial by combat. We're going to decide this right here and now. As I am the I'm the you know reigning liege here. Let's 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 have this out. Let's let's settle this once and for all. Because I'm kind of tired of all this bickering. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. <laughs> and it, it provides those at the feast with a a a, a form of entertainment, so to speak. Um, you know, history likes to kind of pretend that boxing came out of nowhere. In England, um, long after the the, 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 the Renaissance period, uh, but that's really not the case. I mean, you're you're very aware, just as I am, that like the Greco Romans had uh, lots of wrestling going on. Mm -hmm. um, even in the Middle Ages, in Germany, uh, you've got a form of uh, wrestling going on called ringen, and that word is now synonymous in German with wrestling as it's known as in the modern day. Um, but its roots go back to um, the Middle Ages, uh, this, this form of, of different uh, holds and grabs and things uh, that would, people would use kind of a mixed martial art with their weaponry uh, because you can beat at a guy with a sword all day long and full plate, but if you can get him down on the ground and target his you know kind of weak areas uh, his throat is growing, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. or break a bone, despite the plate mail. Um, that's way more efficient than than trying to, you know, beat him to death with a sword or something. Um, and uh, there's a codex from I can't remember the the the, the, the exact date, but it's a, co a codex Waterstein, uh, which shows German knights 
uh, practicing these maneuvers in plate mail even um, to try to uh, disable opponents um, aside from their their weaponry. And so I think that there's kind of a fallacy um, in the historical record in thinking that um, this use of mixed martial arts did not happen during the Middle Ages um, just because, you know, fist strikes weren't really the best method of, of, of um, hurting a guy in armor. Doesn't mean that, like, there's not other forms, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there's even primary documentation showing us that yes, this was something that they trained with. It's something they did. Um, you know, so that being said, these knights would, would definitely kind of have at least some training in that. Mm -hmm. And especially when unarmored, um, I mean, come on among the commoners, nobody got mad at each other and had a fist fight. Seriously. <laughs> Yeah, um, no, no, no. It's a, no, no. The pier, the pier six brawl had just just sprang out right the hell out of nowhere when people came to the states, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like, come on, guys. Like historians, really? Like this wasn't going on at all, at all, really. <laughs> um, but it kind of seems like you know a lot of histories kind of tell it that way. Like, oh, well, you know, the armored knight and the armored warrior, like you know, unarmored combat wasn't the thing. And it's like, well, no, not really, you know. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I, I wrote that in because uh, I thought it'd be a fun thing to do. Uh, and it's, it's just, this is the way it's couched as a quote unquote event mm -hmm. during tourneys um, for that kind of fighting is that, you know, this is something that would often be done um, either as a form of entertainment between events, uh, things like, uh, you know, public gatherings off to the side or um, during feasting. Uh, to settle disputes or you know any number of other permutations but it did happen and i thought it was a fun twist <laughs> there's also uh, let's also not forget that what is what is one um character ar character archetype that you will invariably always see whenever you have a cast of characters that are in a circus oh the acrobat the the monk the the strong man the strong man yeah. And in those in, in a lot of those early circus days, a lot of strong men would ha would would um, have the whole, would have the whole thing of you can't knock me down and I'll and I'll pay g and I'll um I'll pay the, I'll pay the whole pot to whoever mm -hmm. whoever can grapple me and get me off my feet. Well, that's another aspect about uh, tourneys. Um, I mean, which are historically like kind of a sport of the nobles, but I wanted to um, aside from archery tourneys, archery tourneys are kind of a different animal. Mm -hmm. um, commoners often, you know, would get involved with those, like vis-a-vis -vis Robin Hood, right? Um, simply because, like, I, I wanted to, like, include more of, like, what the common people would be doing at these things. Um, like charlatans and knaves running, like, you know, con games and things off to the side. Um, like, all the, just, you've got these masses of people that come to to spectate essentially from the common crowds aside from the nobles who are kind of putting putting on this spectacle mm -hmm. um there's more to it than that there's like everybody in society has to get together because you've got to feed all those people you've got to house all those people um you've got to you know do all this other stuff just to make attorney happen you know and so it's not just about the nobles uh in a sense, it's also about the commoners because they're going to be doing like a myriad of different things um, to be able to like kind of make money and to you know seek out their own profit from all of these people, these these wealthy, powerful people getting together and doing their like little you know war games thing. Um, that gives a great opportunity for role play. Um, one of the things I've been kind of thinking about as I'm writing this book is uh, it would be really fun to kind of play a commoner, like rogue type, you know, mm -hmm. who's just like raking in the cash by, <laughs> you know, thievery or like con artistry or, you know, whatever means uh, kind of taking advantage opportunistically of the, uh, the whole event, you know? Mm hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, when it when it comes to when it comes when it comes to when it comes to jousting, which is is seen as the is seen as the highlight and the thing that and the thing that has the biggest payday. Mm -hmm. Um are there any are there any special rule set that you have that you have regarding how that would be resolved? Absolutely. Um because a military lance is meant to kill a guy. <laughs> and it should. Um in front of for glory the base rules, we've really given a lot of power back to the the, the fighter, the warrior, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and if in the base rules, for instance, if you have a cavalier with a lance riding down on somebody, especially on foot with their lance, uh, especially if they have other cavaliers at their back with the phalanx talent, they are going to be freaking deadly. Um, and that's kind of what me and the other players of the meeting in the background here, the crusaders, uh, play test, um, are gearing up for like we're here for it right uh, that being said in tourney the idea isn't to kill the guy you're you're there to show your martial prowess and especially after about 80 1300 they kind of nerf um as as, as uh jousting comes to the fore um they kind of nerf a lot of the um the military weapons that were being used um, during the period. Uh, plate mail became specialized for tourneys, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, being aware of that technology, we've made a special tourney armor in the, the Grand Tourney book specifically for jousting, just like you know people in real life did. Um, we've also got um, jousting lances, uh, tourney lances, um, those were often made hollow or in sections with a coronel that was designed to like uh, distribute the, the blow as it hit the uh, tourney armor. Um, so it wouldn't pierce through the guy mm -hmm. necessarily, but um, kind of cushion the blow somewhat. And yeah, it's, it's probably knock him off his horse if you hit him hard enough, but um, it's not going to kill him, you know? Um, so, we wrote, you know, a special uh, weapon entry specifically for tourney lances, uh, jousting lances, um, mm -hmm. and, and followed suit with what actual technologies that were developing for tournament play. Uh, for the melee, for instance, um, once you get out of the early tourneys where it was like super bloody and you had like, you know, scores of kippers that would come along with your knight and once you your knight knocked the guy off his horse they'd come and beat him with clubs senseless so you could steal his armor aside from those early grand melee events uh, even with the melee we've got we've got blunted weapon rules etc um, specifically for these tourneys so while they're still extremely dangerous you're still going to take hits um, you're not going to get like killed in one event, unless you're just stupid. <laughs> um, if you follow what I was saying, mm -hmm. um, the joust is still dangerous. You will still take stages of damage off your damage chart. Uh, you will definitely take stun points. Um, I mean, even today, where you have competitive jousting, not just you know, um, kind of as a as a show. Um, those guys take so many concussions that it's like ridiculous. Um, we've kind of talked to a lot of those guys and um, watched a lot of their, their videos and, and things like that interviews. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, aside from that, looked into the, the specific technologies that were built around this uh, tournament uh, fighting as a sport and included those as like uh, a rules expansion within the grand tourney. Mm -hmm. um, so that like you're, for instance, we want there to be a continuity of play between events. Say you're doing a one-on-one -on -one melee, a joust and uh, all on the same day. Mm -hmm. And you've got multiple brackets for each. Well, say, you're starting with the melee in the morning 
okay, cool. Your knight might take stun points each time they're in a heat on the bracket. They've got maybe a couple hours between heats if it's a huge tournament. Okay, so that allows them the opportunity to regain some of their stun points. They might even take a little bit of damage. Um, this not being, you know, D&D &D or like high fantasy. Uh, and the church, historically, not condoning the, the people in this system who do have some healing magic, not condoning, um, you know, tournament play. Um, early on, for instance, the, the church actually said that anybody who died an attorney does not get a church burial and this cannot go to heaven or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really not cool. So that being said, especially after 1300, um, say you have these, these two events in one day, you, you might take a little bit of damage in your melee. You're going to take some stun points. As long as you can time when you're hitting your heats a little bit, um, you should be able to regain stun points and not, you know, get, you know, beat unconscious, which forfeits the match, but be able to kind of manage those resources, get through the melee and still have enough oomph left in you to be able to ride the, the, uh, the joust mm -hmm. later in the day. Um, the joust is one of the most deadly events that we've written so far. About as deadly as the dogs. Yeah, that's my dogs. <laughs> They're obnoxious. Well, they're dogs. <laughs> you know, somebody gets out the, their car down the street, and you know, <laughs> I know. Let us know about it. I'll be I'll be biking by somewhere, and and all of the do and all of the dogs within within line of sight will start going crazy. <laughs> but we've talked we've talked about we've talked we've delved into maintaining that that degree of um histor historical verisimilitude i i don't like the term realism in this regard and i um well we're we're historical fiction mm -hmm. um we try to write as much history into to certain scenarios especially um as possible at the same time there's some things we don't know yeah and at the at the end of the day this is a role playing game um, if we're just going to suss out history, I mean, that's not very fun, you know? The, re um, the reason why I delved into that is, as I was going through the the ter the tournament po the attorney possibilities in my mind, um, there was one avenue of, ter of tournament that, in my not-so-humble opinion, isn't touched on as much that if I was running the grand tourney, I'd, prob I'd, probably, touch I'd probably touch on at some point. And that is using, and this is this especially came to mind with that whole endurance thing that you mentioned, mm -hmm. utilizing a round robin format. <laughs> uh, the only the only major example I can think of 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 what I mean by a round robin format that I see in and that I see in anything nowadays would be the um, would be some of the tournaments that are put on in Japanese pro wrestling, especially. In New Japan, with things like Best of the Super Juniors, World Tag, well, World Tag League's um, single elimination, and um, the G1 Climax. So, when you say round robin, is that it, to make sure I understand? You're you're saying that everybody fights everybody at some point? Yeah. Um, yeah, you could do that. Um, we've set it up more like um, single or double elimination brackets, depending on how long you want to play a, a given mm -hmm. event. Um. If you were if you were to only, and that's the thing is about the grand tourney. Um, if you're doing the kind of mix and match in your own period in your own setting, mm -hmm. uh, with all the rules variants for each of the events, and you get to kind of pick your own events, you know, based on your 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 period and setting. Um, you could do that if you had a smaller group and do it very readily. Uh, however, I think it's more fun if uh, at some points you don't throw some some NPCs in there and um, kind of mix up the lists and, and kind of um, upset the balance a little bit. Um, but I'm sorry, go ahead with what you're saying. Yeah, just the uh, the idea 
And you are cor you're correct in the everybody fights everybody approach, and with that kind of thing, because of the fact that when I look at how I envision running for honor and for glory as a bit of a a bit of a roster centric passion play, um, mixing multiple PCs and NPCs is something that I would do for a hypothetical round robin, especially since mm -hmm. um, the way I've the way I've the way I've viewed um tourneys in this regard isn't isn't too far removed isn't isn't too far removed from from some of from some of the gladiatorial events that were that were done in the past just with a whole mm -hmm. lot less slavery um and also to also in a very roundabout way some of some of the ways that um stuff like track and field meets are tr are treated now yeah, exactly. Um, go ahead. Uh, sorry. <laughs> something with I I could bring up other I could bring up other types of sports, but stuff like track and field is is one that I'd want to bring up because there is never just one event at a track and field meet. Right. Yeah. And well, we've give rules. Um, if you want to reward for a specific event, because not obviously every character is not going to be good at everything. Mm -hmm. So you're going to take some rewards away from say the melee, some rewards away from archery, some rewards away from um, the joust. And it's up to the chronicler. If you're mixing and matching as to like, you know, how you determine an overall winner of the overall tournament, you know, who's the king's champion kind of kind of person at the end. Um, and we give a, a couple of different examples. Um, but oftentimes in history, like, there's not really kind of that overall champion. Um, each event was kind of decided independently. And it was up to popular opinion as to who the overall winner was. Mm -hmm. Um that being said, uh, it's uh, uh, sorry. I'm a couple uh, couple drinks in now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that being said, there's a, a lot of latitude as far as how you want to determine the overall winner. And the real point is not who's the winner or the loser of the tournament per se. But who has gained the most influence at the end of the day? Who is, has um, used the opportunity to best advantage? Some of these uh, characters are, you know, fair fighters. They'll do okay. But where they're going to shine is not on the field, but off it at all the various events surrounding the tourney. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really tried to put a, a highlight on that because... I didn't want this just to end up being a PvP event where like you're just duking it out through events and it's it's just about um, you know necessarily winning the tourney. It's about you know winning the the courtly love of of this particular uh, noblewoman or it's about uh, winning the favor of this powerful duke for your house. It's about um, getting um, you know Duke of Bedford. Uh, who's controlling France right now in the 1425 uh, uh, example that's given in the book uh, to to back your offensive in France um, in the following spring. It's about um, the individual drives that brought these people to compete at this event. So in other words, um, the real rewards aren't necessarily about moving through the brackets, however they're played. You know, single elimination, double elimination, round robin. It's up to the chronicler, um, depending on the group, the dynamic, how many um, non-player characters you're throwing in. It, it's really about how you've achieved your character's goals. Um, mm -hmm. That they, they started, you know, that, that they came to the tourney to achieve. And that's kind of what the, the build point system is about. You know, we don't, we don't uh, reward people for our players. We don't reward characters or players for how much they kill things or how much loot they get, or we reward them for good role play um, in the form of achieving their characters, aims and goals. Mm -hmm. 
and um, how well they, as a player, portrayed that character in doing so. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Getting back to that focus on uh, collective storytelling being the, 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 the major element. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that kind of thing in mind, mm -hmm. um, it's given that I mentioned Pendragon earlier, I, one of the other things I definitely recall is that, is that game having um, its, own set, its own set of rules for feasts. And I'm curious in that regard, not that I'm trying to compare you guys with Pendragon, but how you guys would handle um, feasts for the Grand Tourney. Well, a, a feast, in my mind, shouldn't be, like, uh, mechanized, um, so to speak. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with uh, Pendragon's uh, system for it. Um, looked into it since last time we talked because they're kind of, you know, one of our kind of competing systems. Um, I, a feast should be explicitly a role play opportunity. Uh, if you've got players at the table who know what their characters, who know who their characters are and what they want to achieve in that scenario, um, it should all fall together fairly readily without a explicit mechanic. Um, we do have a few mechanics involved in those sort of scenarios, like um, your social skill, your, you know, et cetera, your, your, your uh, personality score that all work together whenever you try to kind of make a power play. But I didn't feel like there should be an explicit mechanic for what is ostensibly like a, a role play scenario. Um, that being said, a good chronicler in this system would follow up a heated event in which there was conflict between, you know, this, this NPC or this character and this character, um, with, you know, uh, with a feast. Cause that's, that's in the you know, chron chronological order of things. That's what you would do next. You kind of have a cool down period, everybody would go clean up, and then they'd meet for dinner. Uh, so what happened on the field should kind of carry over organically to that. Mm -hmm. So now, again, I, I didn't feel like I needed to, to, to make a mechanic for feasting. Yeah. Which is is certainly understandable. I'm not saying that one way is the on, is the only way or that you need to be like um, pen dragon not Paris that particular thought uh, I'm ju I'm just more look trying to look at this at from as many angles as oh, no, possible I, and I mean, that I, there's lots of mechanics and games for lots of things mm -hmm. and some of them work out really well for what they're trying to do and some of them just kind of get clunky and you know it's just, you kind of have to when you're making a system you kind of have to pick and choose as to, to really what you want your your angle to be you know your focus. Yeah, but we're, clunkiness? We're not talking about riffs here. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> a day will come when I will, st when I will stop using riffs as my whipping boy. Today is not that day. No. <laughs> but in the, in, the vein, in the vein of that, um, something, something that I find very curious regarding, um, int regarding intrigue-based campaigns is the fact that when you're dealing with intrigue it means that you're dealing with a lot of moving parts mm -hmm. especially between player knowledge and character knowledge and in that regard do you plan have you can have you considered putting some sort of sheet or some or something to make the gm's job a little bit easier in terms of managing the web of relationships that's inevitable with this kind of thing uh absolutely um that's what a, a, a large portion of the, uh, the, the intro section of the 1425 um, scenario mm -hmm. in the Grand Tourney. You can design your own, or here is a ton of information laid out um, in, a, in one case, a scatter diagram to kind of show you the, 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 the interconnected web of, of, of um, families, familial ties, and um, 
uh, their uh, political alliances uh, to kind of help you sort out what is going on <laughs> with all these guys, um, as well as a ton of text um, specific to uh, individual characters to kind of give you like role playing cues and, and context and hooks um, to, to, to let you kind of know where you're going. <laughs> Oh, there's the dogs again. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's one of the things I've worked really hard on in the past couple of days on the uh, 1425 um, scenario uh, storyline is that um, there's a lot of, of, of interconnectedness uh, between all of these various uh, factions and, and houses and uh, a lot of different divisions even be within them and between them. And as a chronicler, if you're walking into this without having, you know, in-depth you know, days of, of, of research into what's going on in English politics in 1425, you need to kind of have a, something that kind of lets you reference uh, as a primer as to what you're walking into so you can manage that effectively. Mm -hmm. Now, what are you shooting for as far as a page count? Uh, this is looking like, you know, I'd originally planned for it to be about a uh, uh, 50, uh, maybe 60 page uh, module uh, or, you know, rules, the thematic rules expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's looking more like it's going to be like 70 to 80 at this point. Um, I just keep adding, uh, <laughs> keep adding nobles and contenders. And uh, uh, I'm like, well, you know, I've got these, I've got... Uh, Duke of Bedford and Duke of Gloucester and the, the the Queen Dowager and all these characters and and you know I'm like well I've got all this information about them and how they fit into this whole picture but I really need to give them a character sheet so that way they know what their stats are and it just keeps growing and growing <laughs> uh, so I'm expecting it to be probably a, a, a at least a good 70 80 page book at this point all right and um, as far as a release window what are you shooting for we will be out um, for digital release for our Kickstarters uh, and available on uh, for honorforglory.com, our, our new website, um, in April, early April, around my birthday, and then um, less than a month from now. Well, yeah, less than a month from now. Mm -hmm. And then um, the print versions will be available um, in uh, early May at this point. <laughs> yeah, and with and I will I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how it um, develops. Just make sure not to drown in feature creep. I don't want you to turn into Star Citizen. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um No, I've I've tried to keep the point very focused, but the 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 where I keep adding and adding to it, especially in the, the terms of the, 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 uh, the, the out of the box scenario uh, for England is that there are so many nobles um, that um, really have a, a stake in some, you know, this sort of uh, event and uh, have representatives of their households that would, would readily be there, you know, at the ad attorney when it's called. And uh, by the way, the mm -hmm. fact that, we're having a tourney in England in 1425. That's the fiction part. <laughs> I have no historical evidence whatsoever that that actually happened. But it's an interesting um, point in in uh, English politics and, uh, and, and the English military history uh, that we, we somewhat arb arbitrarily chose for a promo event. And then um, the more we dug into it, it was just like, wow, this is this would be great. To, to put together as a, a, a you know rules expansion slash you know thematic rules expansion as you put it, mm -hmm. um, so we just turned it around into a book. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just I, I keep adding to it because um, it, it just adds more depth and breadth mm -hmm. to the storyline that you could play, and just gives the the, the players because uh, the idea being um, you have all these competitors um i.e potential player characters that you can look through read their bios and, and just pick one and be like okay cool this is going to be my night and they have all of this background um at your fingertips and they're almost 
I think actually everyone that's in the book so far is an actual historical character. I mean, you can Google these guys, you know, Mm -hmm. and get a plethora of information about their lives. Um, So that just gives you as a player playing that character, that gives you so much depth you can play off of. Uh, And then the, the intrigue between them um, is laid out for you in the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, at least to a point <laughs> i've got a like kind of kind of a behind the scenes like chroniclers only section you know mm-hmm. like here's the the the, the secrets <laughs> but um anyway yeah I, I keep adding to it because i just want to give uh players choice in this kind of uh event uh it's it's a kind of a different thing you know i I, I guess the thematic rules expansion would be a great term for it. I've been calling it kind of a module slash rules, small rules expansion, mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, it's, it's kind of a different animal, but it definitely could be played as a standalone story um, over multiple sessions. And, you know, people would have a ball. Mm-hmm. And I will certainly be looking for, looking forward to seeing how it, how it shakes out. But with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to the show Bourbon in Hand to <laughs> enjoy the insanity that comes around at my t- in my temple. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, it's always a, always a blast. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> thanks a lot and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is Mildra I am your gaming monk stay Fucking frosty, everybody!